from where it's just morning, good afternoon uh, in, most, in other parts of the world and probably good evening um, in, in further other parts. Uh, we are very delighted that you could take time this uh, afternoon, morning, evening to join us on this long awaited uh, launch, uh, which has been uh, unfolding. Uh, there's been a very interesting build up to it of the Mixed Migration Review 2020, which is the annual flagship report of the Mixed Migration Center. Um, and uh, I am delighted to be the moderator for the session. My name is Paddy Sianga Knudsen, and I would just like to um, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and finding the time. Uh, as I said, a very interesting journey, um, and we will just go straight into our program um, and just um, ask our, our, our hosts, um, uh, starting off with Charlotte Slente, who is the Secretary General of the Danish Refugee Council, to give us some opening remarks. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to start out by showing you the very beautiful front page of this year's uh, Mixed Migration Review uh, Report. Um, I hope you all look forward to reading it, uh, the ones of you who haven't digged down into it uh, yet. Here it is. We're launching it today. And I'm extremely honored to be here to open this, uh, this event. And I'd like to extend uh, my gratitude to both the panelists as well as the participants to this uh, event for being here uh, virtually with us uh, today. It goes without saying that this year's uh, review is uh, unlike any other review that we have been doing in, uh, in the past. The COVID-19 has created an unprecedented situation with large scales repercussions across the globe and particularly so for the most vulnerable uh, people such as as migrants and, and refugees but also obviously for our staff and and partners on the ground who have had to adapt their methodologies very quickly to a changing and often very challenging uh, environment and challenging circumstances so I commend them for their flexibility, but also for their tireless work, which has allowed us to continue to maintain an overview of key uh, trends pertaining to mixed migration in, in 2020, as well as all the risks and how we can help address and mitigate those risks and challenges to increase uh, the protection of and access to the rights for people who are on the move. This year's uh, Mixed Migration Review focuses on cities and mixed migration. And that obviously reflect, reflects the fact that the majority of the world's displaced populations, uh, some 60% of, of refugees and 80% of IDPs, they currently live in cities. So while city, cities and urban centers often provide refugees and migrants with opportunities for both learning and uh, income generating activities as well, which can increase their self-reliance and their resilience. These settings also at times increase uh, exposure to a number of uh, protection related, related uh, risks. And that's become even more evident during COVID-19 where many migrants and refugees have become particularly vulnerable to unemployment, exploitation, uh, poor housing conditions, and also increased uh, threats of eviction and deplorable living conditions uh, and limited access in many instances to basic uh, services. So refugees and migrants in, in urban settings also face uh, greater dangers. They face greater rates of crime, discrimination, stigma, harassment, and not least women and, all, and other vulnerable groups uh, among them. And that trend has also become more pronounced during the COVID-19 pandemic where people on the move have often been accused of being carriers of the virus. You'll hear much more about these challenges as well as the opportunities in the interventions of uh, our esteemed colleagues and experts who will participate in, in the launch of, of today. But let me first remind you that uh, this is the third annual MMC review that we are doing. And also to remind you why the Mixed Migration Center was established in the first place when the Danish Refugee Council back in 2018 decided to launch this initiative. 
The Mixed Migration Center was established and created as a global platform grounded in evidence and grounded in analysis that can offer a voice of reason and a voice of reflection in the often extremely emotional and rather politicized debates on migration and people on the move. Today, the Mixed Migration Center plays a key role for DRC, uh, where data and analysis, as well as, as the field presence uh, regionally, provide very valuable, valuable inputs to evidence-based programming, but also evidence-based advocacy in support of the people on the move. And it also helps us inform uh, policymakers. As always, the Mixed Migration uh, Review provides very interesting and novel perspectives on the phenomenon of mixed migration. Uh, and it does so sh through uh, short essays, uh, data and stories from refugees and migrants themselves. In my view, it's a very rich report and it offers much needed nuance and expert analysis on a topic that is uh, very politicized and, and that normally carries very emotional accounts, but which ought to be approached from a much more analytical angle which is what we've set out to do. So I really encourage you all, policymakers, practitioners, journalists, researchers, humanitarian actors, partners, and others alike to read this report for inspiration, for reflection, and so that we can collectively try to change the narrative and improve our response and policies to mixed migration for the benefit of, uh, of all, and also, obviously, in sticking to our promise to leave no one, one behind. So thanks, thank you all for being here today. And thanks for your continued support. And I hope that you'll find today's discussion very enriching and insightful. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Charlotte, for those opening remarks. Um, I think we are in for a very enlightening discussion. As you have said, we have a uh, a highly packed panel, but uh, and, and, and also, you know, we can see that the room keeps loading. Thank you to the nearly 200 participants who were with us in the room. Um, uh, I, I was trying to see if it could be synonymous to what we have in terms of the number of pages we have in the report, which is 280. Let's see how we reach uh, with, that, uh, with that number, of, uh, with that target. Uh, and maybe without much further ado to just, um, you know, give us his opening remarks, I would like to call upon the head of the Mixed Migration Center, Mr. Bram Frauz who would just uh, deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, Bram. Thank you very much, uh, Patty. Good morning, good afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, I like you're setting the bar high there, Patty, with uh, the number of pages and participants. We're almost there. Um, so on behalf of the Mixed Migration Center, I would like to welcome everyone again at the launch of the Mixed Migration Review 2020. Uh, and it's really great to see so many people from so many corners of the world uh, joining us here today. I think that's one of the advantages of the current situation we're in. We can really reach a large audience here. Um, I really hope all of you will be actively engaging with us uh, over the course of today's event, uh, but also after that to continue uh, this important conversation. So I'm very happy and really proud to present to you the 2020 edition of our flagship annual report, uh, which went online a few uh, hours ago this morning. Um, and as Charlotte said, we started this series in 2018. Uh, and every year when we start, we are a little bit anxious. What are we going to be able to again, fill a full report of more than 200 pages with interesting uh, new and also accessible content. Uh, and of course, this is something you will have to decide uh, for yourself, but I think we managed to do so again. Uh, and Chris Horwood, the lead editor of the Mixed Migration Review, uh, will tell you a bit more about the report and the various uh, elements in it in a few minutes. Um, so as you've surely seen and, and heard by now, the overarching focus uh, of this report uh, is urban migration, mixed migration in cities. And in a bit, I will say a few more words about why we have chosen uh, this focus. Uh, but first, I would like to express some words of appreciation. Uh, first of all, a thank you to all the donors of the Mixed Migration Center, uh, and in particular, a big thanks to those that most directly contribute to the development of the Mixed Migration Review. Uh, the Swiss, the Danish and French Ministries of Foreign Affairs, the Robert Bosch Foundation uh, and ICMPD. Also a big thanks to the Danish Refugee Council, 
for continuing to support the Mixed Migration Center, to all the MMC colleagues in the region, to Chris as the lead editor of this report, to all the other authors of the essays, and of course, to the interviewees. And last but not least, and importantly, also to our network of four of my monitors around the world who are interviewing refugees and migrants every single day. And to all the refugees and migrants themselves, more than 10,000 again in the past year who shared their stories with us. And in particular, a huge appreciation to the four of my teams and monitors for their incredible flexibility and commitment in this really challenging year that enabled us to adapt our four of my data collection system to a remote system when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March. And this has enabled us to continue interviewing and collecting data on how COVID-19 has been impacting on people's lives and migration journeys. And of course, the data from this uh, For My project from eight selected cities around the world features in the Mixed Migration Review. So that brings us back to the overarching topic, urban mixed migration. Why did we choose this topic? As Marvin Rees, the mayor of Bristol, said in his interview in this year's uh, Mixed Migration Review, most migrants leave cities, travel through cities, turn up in cities, and return to cities. So this is the urban reality of mixed migration, the reality of human mobility. The majority, as Charlotte also said, the majority of refugees, IDPs, internal migrants, and international migrants live in cities. So if we talk about mixed migration, or even migration in general, we have to include cities in this conversation. And while migration policies are discussed and defined at national levels, cities are ultimately the first responders. And we see many cities around the world that whether for ethical or pragmatic reasons or both, adopt a more wel welcoming and more progressive approach to migration and integration issues. And whereas nation states often stress national sovereignty in discussions on migration, perhaps cities lack relative lack of sovereignty compared to that of nation states, ironically makes them more powerful. So not having to worry about giving up sovereignty, they are perhaps more powerful to seek common interest and cooperate across borders on important global challenges such as migration. And this is increasingly happening already. And there's a lot we feel we can learn from how cities do this, how they approach this issue. And I'm therefore really glad, glad that we managed to interview several mayors uh, in our report. Uh, and of course, also have the Mayor's Migration Council represented on the panel here today. The positive examples we see at city level, unfortunately stand in sharp contrast with some of the actions and policies implemented by states. And as in last year's uh, edition, the MMR 2020, again, provides a really sobering overview of what we came to call a normalization of the extreme, a range of examples of harsh treatment of refugees and migrants. This year, sometimes under the cover of COVID, and we see this happening in many countries around the world. And sadly, the list this year is even longer than last year. We hope by documenting such practices and offering reliable data and nuanced analysis throughout this report to create awareness and contribute to changing this narrative and responses to mixed migration based on principles and values instead of this ongoing political panic. There's a lot more in the report, most of it as we said, around this topic of cities and mixed migration, which is and will remain a key focus for the Mixed Migration Center, not only through the Mixed Migration Review, uh, but also, for example, through a series of in-depth urban case studies on mixed migration, uh, five of which we published over the course of last week, conducted by our MMC regional hubs, focusing on Bogota, Tunis, Bamako, Nairobi, and Kuala Lumpur. So to end, we think this is a new edition of the Mixed Migration Review that is really worth diving into. Uh, but please, I would invite you all, everybody online joining us here today, if you have any feedback on this report, please do write to us, give us this feedback so that we can continue to make it better. Thank you very much. Enjoy reading the report and please enjoy the discussions today with an excellent uh, group of speakers and panelists. Thank you very much and back to you, Patty. Bram, thank you for those opening remarks. Um, as a migration researcher myself, I found the, the whole journey into the launch of the report quite interesting. You know, when you started off with the release of the quarterly reports in the different regions that the MMC covers, 
and you know, even get, giving you this sharper lens into vulnerabilities that migrants and, and, and refugees uh, are facing on particular routes are uh, looking at Western North Africa. And then that last week, you know, uh, day by day, these kind of updates that come from, uh, from cities. Uh, luckily, I've lived in, in two of those cities. And even having been a migrant in those cities, it was quite interesting to see how those vulnerabilities uh, that migrants and refugees face have been brought out in the reports. So indeed, uh, one would be looking forward to what you're doing in the space uh, post the, the launch of, of this event. Uh, but like Bram said, you know, we have, a, we have an excellent opportunity today for us to engage uh, into this report, uh, for us to engage around the topics that this, this report uh, has, has highlighted. Uh, and then, uh, but before we do that, we just ask, you know, Chris Howwood, who is the lead editor, um, to just run us through um, uh, what the MMR 2020 looks like. Uh, Chris, over to you. Hi, uh, can you see me? I can only see you, Paddy. I see. Okay. Well, good day, everyone, and thank you for showing up and show much interest in this year's Mixed Migration Review. We've been honored and a little surprised even by the level of support and interest that the uh, reviews have had since they've started in uh, 2018. At that time, there was a real gap in terms of publications uh, bringing together reflections and discussions on the issue, let alone summarizing regional situational reports and offering and, uh, annual roundups relating to mixed migration. So we tried to fill that space with this idea of a new review type document that combined expert opinion, local, um, I mean, sorry, global roundups, primary data, which the Mixed Migration Center was collecting at an unprecedented scale from migrants on the move, migrants and refugees, and also interviews with thought leaders and commentators of interest in the sector. Um, as some of you may know, the first uh, uh, mixed migration review in 2018 was somewhat experimental and focused on a wide range of issues relating to mixed migration, human smuggling, the drivers, the scale of human rights abuses and deaths involving those in mixed flows, as well as the policy panic and the political disruptions arising from a highly publicized but numerically low uh, level of irregular migration. The second MMR last year looked at mixed migration futures. Initially, we were hesitant, thinking there wouldn't be enough to fill the a report, um, but soon we saw there were relevant and lots of urgent, uh, interesting things to be said about the demographic changes, future urbanization, fast accelerating climate change, artificial intelligence, and the fourth industrial revolution, and its impact on migration, of course, not to mention future securitization of borders. And so we come to this year, the third publication, Mixed migration in cities. The fact that almost all those in mixed migration movements, all irregular migrants, most legal migrants, those smuggled, those trafficked, those moving of their own volition and agency, and of course, all internal migrants end up in urban centers and very often in a limited number of megacities was a fact that had been staring us in the face for a long time. Once pointed out, it's obvious to see, and then you start seeing its implications everywhere. In terms of cities and in terms of cities and migration, you see it in the past, you see it in the present, and how it might look in the future. A future that many of us on this virtual meeting, of course, could be involved in shaping and influencing with relation to migrants and refugees. In the review itself, after offering a full regional catalogue of mixed migration events and political and policies globally, it starts to explore the issues in more details in more detail through essays, interviews, data presentation, as well as the photo selection and captions. Not only are the three areas of security and protection, urban development, and the national and local contentions that we'll be discussing today in the panel, but also in terms of how cities all over the world are adapting to and planning to adapt to the new normal of urban life with relatively high proportions of people from mixed flows. Millions of new arrivals, the future workforce, future artists, future AI engineers, future medical researchers, future urban planners, but only if they're integrated inclusively, only if it's a success. What will make it a success is what needs to be established and implemented. That's easier said than done, of course, because this isn't just a technical problem. It's a highly charged socio-political one. 
Other essays and interviews look at the role of governance in relation to the local municipal level, but also in terms of international instruments and the institutions such as the Global Compacts and the new role of the Mayor's Migration Council. Also in this review, smuggling and how certain cities are hubs and concentrations of criminal enterprise and expertise for the billion dollar industry that is human smuggling. Also how those on the move from the growing and inexorable forces of climate change are already and certainly will in the future face new environmental stresses once they are in city, in cities, as climate change uh, increasingly bites harder. The seas are rising and more extreme weather is coming our way. So many of the world's cities, so many of the world's cities are coastal and so many of the world, so much of the world's population live in those cities. Also for many of those who come to cities, their story is far from over as they often experience secondary movement and intercity, intercity and intracity displacement. But throughout the review, we keep revisiting the fact that cities are remarkable and transformative places of refuge and new beginnings for millions. An idea conceptualized by the author Doug Sanders in his 2011 bestseller, Arrival City. Doug also wrote an essay for this review and he gave an interview to us with interesting new insights from his new research a decade on from his first work. Finally, the unavoidable zeitgeist of this year is of course the pandemic, excuse me. <coughs> COVID-19, this review examines the impact of COVID, sorry, this review examines the impact COVID is having on cities and migration, including how it has an uneven impact on city residents and unexpected reverse migrations have occurred in involving millions of people. Using exclusive COVID specific data collected from the 4MI network and interviewing a key Oxford analyst on migration during the pandemic and exploring the regional impacts in an essay with original analysis, this review recognizes the gravity of the impact of COVID in cities this exceptional year, but with particular focus on refugees and migrants. Additionally, as Bram has just mentioned, governments in all regions have used the pandemic to implement, implement harsh and sometimes illegal strategies to deter, prevent, reverse and contain movement. We try to document this in a section called the normalization of the extreme, which sadly is not reading for the faint hearted and when read altogether is quite shocking and shaming. There are some additional sectors that are in this year, such as a series of migrant stories from the migrants themselves of how they came to cities and what life is like for them in cities. It's a good complement to the more theoretical essays. And then because cities have many faces, there's also a section offering 17 brief urban spotlights. Each spotlight highlighting a different theme, such as inclusion cities, intolerable cities, return cities, sanctuary cities, pandemic cities, drowning cities, gang cities, etc. So these spotlights represent a different face of the city, always in relation to migrants and refugees. In each spotlight city is selected an example, a, a, a city is selected as an example, as a case study of that theme. So finally, this year for the first time, in addition to the core team, we're invited, we invited a range of commentators and writers to contribute to the review. Some of them I can see are listening to this meeting right now. Between them, between them and the interviewees and essayists, uh, we're, we're almost about two dozen people. It wasn't an easy process to manage, attempting to corral and direct the huge variety of views and approaches through our mixed migration lens was tricky, but we did it. And we feel the review is richer for it. I'm hoping you will feel the same and that this brief overview and the following debate irresistibly whets your appetite. And with that, I'll hand you over to Paddy. Thank you. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a nice way to sort of wrap up a 280 page report um, and, and, and you give a lot of appetite uh, in terms of diving into the different sections. Um, I myself have felt that you, know, you couldn't really read it as a book from, you know, from one page to the next, but actually that you would need to dive into the different sections uh, with a, a lot of rich uh, information. Um, uh, and, and like you have said, you know, some, some differences to, to how the other reports have been uh, and, and the work that the MMC is, is doing out there. Um, 
And now we are into the next uh, session, sort of of our of, of our launch event, where we would like to have an opportunity to um, to call upon some different experts from the the migration space uh, that allow us to dive into the very particular issues that uh, that, that the report um, has has highlighted. Um, and this is sort of you know really looking at you know these cities of risk, the cities of opportunities, and uh, and sort of what is the space um, that's out there for these cities to expand. Um, and uh, without um, without uh, without sort of um, um, without any any order in, in in no particular order, we have decided to sort of stage the next part of our session into three separate topics. Um, and the first topic, um, I would like to invite um, Otilia uh, Maunganidze, who is the head of special projects at the Institute for South African Studies in Pretoria. Um, and just as I introduce um, uh, Otilia, making sure that I think she's, she is obviously here with us, uh, just to let you know that Otilia joined um, the ISS in 2009, and she's currently the head of the special projects in the office of the executive director. And before joining, she used to be uh, a junior legal advisor, as well as a human rights education officer. Uh, her work has explored uh, for, the IS, uh, for the ISS, uh, and it helps to inform a lot of institutional strategy. Um, she's, her areas of interest include uh, international criminal justice, international human rights, migration trends and policy, and she also has a master's um, in, in fundamental rights litigation and international uh, human rights law from the University of South Africa. I thought that that, interest, that that introduction is actually very interesting as we set the scene for the first topic that we are going to ask uh, Otilia to help us dive in. Um, and in this topic, we're going to look at protection and risks in cities. And here we're asking ourselves, risky cities, mean streets, what does that really mean in the context of, of refugees and migrants in, in the urban settings in terms of what kind of, you know, are they facing greater dangers? Are we looking, you know, and what kind of, of, of dangers are they facing? Are we looking at harassment? What is happening uh, in terms of how other, other residents are, are viewing them? And Otilia, just as I ask you to bring your mic, I think what we would like to hear a lot from you is what you sort of see as the potential causes for this heightened vulnerability. And then of course, you know, here, please bring us into the context of, of COVID. And I'm, I'm going to combine two questions for you. Um, and the next one that really looks at, you know, this concept that migrants and refugees are, for, are seen, and I'm, I'm careful to use the, uh, the quotation, to pose a risk to cities. Could you just walk us through uh, uh, this in your intervention and we will, we will, we will, we will uh, bounce off as we go through this conversation. Otilia. Thank you very much, Paddy. Uh, I must say it's an extreme honor to, to speak today. I am speaking to all of you from the city of Tuane, where the capital city of South Africa, Pretoria is. It is also in Gauteng province, a province that was built on the backs of migrant labor over centuries and decades past. It is also a region that is essentially today uh, in many ways, uh, a melting pot of different cultures and customs um, uh, expanding from the Southern African region broader into the rest of the continent. Why do I start responding to Paddy's question with that? Because while there's a recognition of the role that migrants, particularly migrant labor, have played in building the Gauteng province and ultimately the economic hub of South Africa, it also comes at a time, just barely a few weeks ago, when the former mayor of Johannesburg, Herman Mashaba, in his remarks around what is struggling, what South Africa is struggling with, he pointed to what he dubbed as 15 million undocumented migrants in South Africa. South Africa is a country with a population of under 60 million. His assertion was that at least uh, over a, a third of the population were in fact undocumented migrants. He was quickly fact-checked, but the harm of those words and the, and, the, and, the, and the spreading narrative around there are far too many uh, migrants within South Africa and perhaps far too many that are undocumented is something that we have seen seep into the ways in which migrants and refugees are viewed within the South African space. This is not to say that everyone views them in this way, by no measure. In fact, the recognition of migrants as being part of building South African society almost goes without saying. Whether they are international migrants from the sub-region 
or people migrating from other parts of the country, from the provinces into the cities in search of work, but also essentially to build what we regard as the engine of South Africa. But what has come with that is some xenophobic sentiments, uh, isolationism, particularly with regards to African migrants. Of course, this means it poses a great threat to how you are able to ensure protection of migrants within the space, but also advance the vision of an inclusive and integrated society. I will end uh, in, in this initial response, Paddy, by alluding to some of the myths, so to speak, in, in attributed to, to migrants. First, there is the allegation that migrants come to South Africa to steal people's jobs, to take away opportunities that are intended for South African citizens. At the same time, arguments that if there were less migrants within South African society, there would be better service delivery. Often migrants seen, unfortunately, as the, the, the scapegoats for some of the failures in administration and governance. It is important to note here the relevance and importance of the work that has been done by the Mixed Migration Center and the many people that they've spoken with and interviewed across the world, and in particular in emphasizing those spaces and cities where the benefit of migration is understood and, and being leveraged for better. These are lessons that can be drawn across the rest of the world in looking to innovative ways to ensure inclusive development, in looking to ways to acknowledge governance failures and, and, and trying to respond to those. But importantly, in also shaping a future that is very much informed by our past and in many ways that advances protection over vilification. Otilia, thank you for those remarks. Um, and just thinking about, you know, what you've said about, you know, ensuring sort of this space that's much more inclusive. How do you foresee, um, you know, the role that governments, civil society, um, and as well as the urban residents in, in, in ensuring that we are, you know, we're doing better and we're doing things differently to mitigate the threats, um, as well as, you know, as well as increasing the protection that these um let's i mean the asset the, the essential migrants uh, have in our societies mm. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I think in, in, in your posing the question, you've spoken about the various actors that need to be working together. And this, uh, and let me add to your list also the private sector, but the communities themselves. One of the main issues, particularly when it comes to integration and inclusion, is this idea that you can impose it from a state level without involving the very people that engage and interact with migrant communities all the time. And I think it is here that you can actually be able to see and harness the potential. When I speak about the, the Gauteng here in South Africa being uh, essentially the national economic hub, but let me be frank, it's also the regional economic hub that has benefited from migrant labor. It's important then to see how you can be able to ensure that communities recognize the benefits, but also work together with the state and private sector to be able to mitigate this. In order for that to happen, there has to be leadership. In the absence of leadership from state level, whether it's provincial government or national government level, you will have this disjoint. But the one thing, and I'm going to stress this point, I, 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 I quoted uh, the former mayor of Johannesburg in his views around the far too many migrants in society. It was people on Twitter, it was people in the media that refuted those claims. And they didn't refute those claims with nothing other than you are talking, uh, mind my English, rubbish but actually they refuted it by relying on facts and data, by going to the information that is readily available through the statistics office, but also by relying on leveraging uh, the positive. If it had been done by any other entity, let's say an opposition political party or a political party that has a particular interest against the former mayor, for example, it might not have been received. He himself disregarded the facts. He doesn't care for them. But the people that were watching and monitoring what was being said uh, noted the importance of facts. So often 
the people who will be able to lead the charge are not necessarily the people in power, but the people in power have to work with communities. Without that, you're simply not going to have the inclusive and integrated society that we're working to achieve. Otilia, thank you. I'm wondering, I think we have a, a great opportunity here to bring in two of our other panelists who are with us in the room. And I have deliberately will not make a, a very long introduction because she will lead us into the next session. But I would just like to ask Marta Foresti, who is the director of ODI Europe and the lead of the Human Mobility Initiative at the Overseas Development Institute in London, to just come in and give us a bit of her reflections in terms of how she looks at the issue of protection and particularly centering on urban migration. Migration. Marta, you are welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paddy. Actually, the, um, and thank you very much for this opportunity to um, participate in this, in the launch of this really landmark report every year. It's so important to keep that focus on the reality of mixed migration, uh, which basically nobody else does, but the Mixed Migration Centre, thankfully, does for all of us. Um, so the question of protection, I'd like to frame the question of protection in the same space as the question of opportunity. And uh, perhaps later I'll share with you a little bit more thoughts on how in practice cities offer, in my view, a pretty unique opportunity to uh, reconcile some of the really polarized dichotomies that have characterized so much debate on migration um, uh, in the past few years. Uh, but coming on specifically to this question of protection and, and opportunities, let me go back to something we heard earlier um, by, from Chris um, uh, reflecting on the report this year and the devastating effect and impact that COVID-19 has had on migrant populations around the world, who in most cases have found themselves as being even more vulnerable to the pandemic due to the inability to move or lack of access to healthcare um, and other matters. Yet at the same time, what we have learned this year um, with COVID is precisely also the contribution that migrant and refugee workers have made to responding to the pandemic, um, both in the emergency phases and actually even more so today as part of the global workforce that will actually, you know, will be um, fundamental to, um, for the reset and for the recovery uh, from COVID. And both things are true. It's, um, it's actually a little bit pointless to insist on just focusing on one aspect of the equation or the other. And yet so much of the conversations we have about migration tend to do that, tend to focus on either the vulnerability protection end or on the sort of positive narrative about the contribution of migration. So I think COVID and the way COVID has, um, has impacted all of us urban residents offers a particular an opportunity to try to shift um, that narrative um, along the way and to try to break down some of these barriers um, that so often character characterize the debate on migration in ways that frankly, you know, much as we wish to create a new narrative, uh, we're a little bit stuck with the old narrative until we actually can move on from, um, from, from some of these dichotomies. Um, protection and opportunity is only one. The other obvious one, which is where the Mixed Migration Report makes a, you know, a phenomenal contribution is of course, the different types of human mobility and the different uh, legal entitlements that different kinds of migrants have. Uh, where again, it's terribly important to reinforce the fact that these are different, but in the urban space, the reality is that so many people move to, whether they are international migrants or national migrants, whether they are people who travel to cities, apply for asylum and ultimately achieving refugee status, or those that are primarily economic migrants, so to speak, looking for opportunities. Again, seen from an urban lens, from what is the composition of urban residents around the world, this becomes less relevant in terms of you know, the defining features for policies, but much more how to create inclusive you know, urban societies where everyone, existing residents, new residents, migrant refugees, and many others can enjoy, you know, can enjoy the same opportunities and the same, um, and the same rights. And finally, and this is rarely said, and, and, and I'll share with you a little bit more on um, how that plays out in, in relation to cities from Africa and Europe. But the other important dichotomy that um, the, the work on cities, so looking at migration from a city's perspective helps to do, is to break down this idea that migration is, always has an origin and a destination. Cities is where migrants go to 
is where migrants often leave from, is where migrants temporarily move, temporary move to. It was really helpful to look at global cities as cities, as places of destination, but also transit and origins of uh, people on the move in ways that allows us to break down this fairly unhelpful way of imagining migration as a matter of somebody that leaves from one place, typically a poor country and travels and safely to a richer country that becomes a destination. It's so much more than that and everything in between. And often what is in between is cities and the opportunities that cities provide um, for, for, for my refugees and other migrants. And so protection is, I think is important in cities gets framed around all these other very important and practical concepts that help us move along the way to find solutions and practical approaches to address the realities of human mobility. Marta, thank you uh, for that intervention. And just to ask Samir Saliba, who is the head of practice at the Mayor's Migration Council in New York. Samir, um, could you give us your perspectives on, 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 on this topic? Yeah, thank you, Patty. Um, and thank you to uh, the Mixed Migration Center, the other mayors, uh, the other MMC, <laughs> um, for inviting me to this panel. And um, congratulations on really a fantastic report that I think provides really concrete data but as the other panelists have touched on, really attempts to, to change the narrative, which I think is really important. Um, the, one of the topics that's in the agenda is national versus local migration policies, pragmatic rebellion, question um, mark. And I'm just gonna quickly focus my remarks on that. Um, I think, you know, on the topic of pragmatic rebellion, I think it's more important to discuss what I would term pragmatic alignment between national governments and city governments rather than a rebellion. And one of the core goals of the Mayor's Migration Council where I work is to foster policy coherence between national governments and city governments on strategic aspects of migration and governance. And I think we're starting to see why that's so important today as the world responds to COVID-19 in an era within this era of unprecedented migration flows. So you have 90% of reported COVID-19 cases in urban areas and cities are now on the front lines of a global public health crisis which is com uh, compounding the issues of inequality and further marginalizing at-risk groups such as migrants, refugees, and internally displaced. And while the pandemic has impacted all people and all aspects of society, it has nonetheless presented unique challenges to many people on the move due to their legal status, their immigration status, reliance on informal employment, things like that. So what you're seeing, and I think the report really does a good job of highlighting this and includes mayor's voices, which I think is really Im important, but what you're seeing is that it's mayors and city governments that are showing up and showing leadership in responding to the needs of these people. Um, local leaders are shaping powerful, innovative and inclusive responses to meet the needs of their communities. And they're doing so despite the fact that their needs far exceed their current capacities. Uh, in my last job at the International Rescue Committee, I often had the talking point that the cities hosting the most displaced are doing so with the fewest resources. With COVID-19, that disparity is only increasing. The economic devastation has been especially difficult for cities in lower income countries, which already face shrinking budgets and are constantly forced to do more with less. And it's precisely these cities, the Kampalas, the Freetowns, the Mogadishus of the world that are also experiencing rapid growth in part due to migration. And the point that I Yes. So Mayor, just uh, just on that one. Um, so I just wanted to uh, just just coming in particularly on that very point, looking at limited resources, looking at the flow of IDPs and refugees into cities. Do you just want to give me a one minute uh, and then I will bring you back to give me uh, your full sure. presentation later on in, in the last session that really talks about protection, uh, just 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 bringing it down to the protection angle. Yeah, I think I mean, on the protection angle. I really like Marta's framing of protection as opportunity. And I think, you know, the, the, the point here is that I, I think often the point is made that cities provide protection and include migrants and refugees within their services because they have no other choice. Um, and I think the, the, we, in order, part of flipping the narrative is really acknowledging that they do have a choice. And I think Otilia's example of Johannesburg is perhaps an unfortunate example um, where, you know, the narrative isn't quite where it should be. Um, but there are other cities that are, you know, making a concrete choice to include migrants and refugees, be it through 
um, you know, in Kampala, where we have the, the mayor literally handing out food himself to people who fall outside of the national uh, social protection uh, services, or in Freetown, where Mayor Aki Sawyer is repurposing a training center for armed forces into a care center for COVID-19 patients, regardless of, of migration status. And that's the kind of protection that uh, cities are making a choice to, to enact. Super, Samara. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for that intervention on protection. And now, as part of the of of of, the, of our discussion, we had asked uh, some of our registered uh, participants to give us some um, some of their questions. So I will I will call upon Eric Grady. Uh, you would just give a, a short, uh, brief intro of who you are and, and and speak a bit directly into your question on the topic related to protection, Eric. Yeah, um, thank you very much for for having me as part of this event, and um, it's it's good to good to be here with everybody, um, at least remotely today. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll share a little reflection first, just sort of. Uh, so I'm the migration editor at large um, at the New Humanitarian, um, and I will share a little bit of a reflection. Um, sort of based on the perspective from a journalistic perspective on this question of protection um, for uh, migrants and refugees and particularly focusing in on the pandemic because um, basically since March, the question of how um, the pandemic is impacting um, migration has really taken over um, our coverage as it has also taken over, I think the coverage of, of numerous topics. Um, and early on, there was sort of a, a push and pull um, that we were seeing between um, you know, people sort of calling for uh, migrants and refugees to be included in um, the response to the pandemic, uh, making sure they had access to health care, livelihood support, et cetera, um, versus uh, on the other side of the equation, sort of governments who were using the pandemic as an excuse to uh, implement hardline policies that really excluded people. Um, and as things have progressed from those first couple of months, um, it seems like sort of one side of that equation has taken over the picture a bit. Um, you know, just thinking about the, the coverage that we have had on, um, on the New Humanitarian, uh, you know, in the past months, it's basically been trying to keep a spotlight on um, a lot of the abuses that are happening at borders. Um, to uh, migrants and refugees during the pandemic. And sort of this question of inclusion and protection has um, fallen by the wayside because of this, uh, you know, the, the, the crises at borders. Um, so, so my question for, for the panelists um, is sort of how do we, I, I guess, in your, from, from your various perspectives, have, have you sort of seen a regression on um, the interest in including migrants and refugees um, in responses to the pandemic um, as this has progressed, has attention sort of shifted elsewhere? Um, and um, how do we keep this in the conversation and sort of on the top of the agenda moving forward, especially thinking about things um, such as vaccine access? Um, so yeah, that's my question. Otilia, uh, I'll let you answer that and maybe either Samir or, uh, or Marta can come in for about a minute. Um, right, thank you very much, uh, Eric, for that question. Uh, you know, it almost goes without saying, but uh, with, a num with the majority of countries rather imposing various forms of travel restrictions and therefore essentially securing their borders, um, for access into, into their countries. What, what you have described, uh, at least uh, for the continent is something that is quite real. More so for countries like South Africa uh, that have had a higher number of infections, but also have kept for the, for the most part their uh, borders closed. Now, one of the key challenges, and this is almost the the, 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 the straddling the line, uh, I would say, between on the one hand, those people that are migrating voluntarily for, for various reasons, and those that have been forcibly displaced or those that are fleeing persecution and the limitations um, that this comes with. And the unique, I would say, challenges that it comes with. 
Um, as part of the work that we've done uh, at the Institute uh, for Security Studies, we've covered the, the, the impact that this has had on refugees in particular and asylum seekers and the challenge it has when they simply do not have access. So you're knocking on a closed door, so to speak. And then on the other hand, around the many challenges that um, people who ordinarily would have traveled through legal channels now may opt for uh, illicit ways to cross borders um, and the evolving trends around smuggling of persons, not only in the Southern African region, but quite prominently also across the Sahelian band as well, West Africa into North and, 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 and the Horn of Africa. Now, what this means long-term is something that we're yet to see, but I do think there has to be a serious rethink, uh, if I can put it that way as a proposal, but there has to be a serious rethink around the way we are able to manage what is essentially a health crisis while also balancing uh, other imperatives. And the final point, which relates to access, uh, particularly when it comes to a COVID vaccine, I often say, and I've said this before the pandemic actually, in respect to comments that were made around uh, foreigners being allowed to have access to public health care. And mine was simple. It is that whether it's the flu or whether it's the, um, the coronavirus or any other uh, infectious disease or otherwise, they simply do not discriminate on the basis of nationality that an authority may do so doesn't change the fact that they do not. And so if you want to protect everyone within the, 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 the borders um, from further infection, it almost goes without saying, but a vaccine in this context has to be inclusive. Otherwise it's not effective. Otelia, thank you for that. Uh, Marta or Samer, uh, either one of you could just come in very quickly. I'm happy to come in with the uh, just with the European perspective. Then maybe uh, others have others. Um, okay, let me try uh, four uh, point as an answer very quickly. The first, so um, it's obvious that um, uh, COVID has made moving harder, and therefore that has negatively impacted those who, to begin with, found it harder to, you know, to cross the border with, uh, you know, with you know, with visa restrictions or other matters. So that's there is no doubt that. The, the immobility that COVID has led to makes it harder for those who have restricted rights to migrate. Second, on the other hand, is that I would say that from certainly from a European perspective, nothing has changed. And some of the difficulties that we had before in relation to the treatments and the fulfillment of rights of migrants were uh, remained unchanged. Um, what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, you know, yet again, more tragedy unfolding in the Mediterranean is nothing new. What was happening there was what was happening was happening there was happening uh, before uh, before COVID um, and 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 other matters of we will be so or the, or the summer, for example, in the UK with scaremongering around people coming from across the channel. Um, it's just that the same old um, stories, the same old attempt to politicize uh, migration. Third, um, however, um, I actually think that with COVID, certainly in Europe, we have seen a, an awareness around the contribution of the migrant workforce to um, the public, you know, to our societies and economies that wasn't there before. And so, for example, we've seen a few examples in the UK, a couple of U-turns, a few of many of this government to recognize um, the rights to healthcare, for example, to um, care workers who were originally excluded, um, some um, processes in Italy, in France, uh, other places to regularize um, uh, migrants in different sectors. And so although they're not in any way, you know, you know, the silver bullet, if anything, you've seen moving a little bit the dial of actually recognizing that um, when, you know, when migrants' rights are not respected, that has negative effects for everyone and, frankly, is not fair and is not right and some reactions to it. Mm -hmm. And so um, the fact that these are all, these are all dimensions of what happened around COVID. And I think as a community, we need to be a little bit careful to overemphasize or to only focus on the vulnerability or the negative effect that COVID had on migrants and to really learn to use the language of what has been the contribution that migrants and refugees are making collectively with all of us uh, to the reality the pandemic brought about. 
Thank you, Marta, uh, for that call on a, on a, on a balanced uh, on a balanced representation of the picture uh, that we have in front of us and our reality. And I think uh, uh, Samir will ask you to comment during the question and answer session. And I think it's a, it's a good point for for me to just uh, let our audience uh, be aware that there is a possibility to do a question and answer session uh, later on as we will finish with the next two topics. Um, and so please do feel free to send in your questions into uh, the chat box and we have a, a very innovative system these days with chat boxes that we will do a bit of a voting because we, we do realize that we have a limited time to hold um, our panelists uh, here with us uh, who, have, uh, who have kindly um, uh, accepted to be with us. So um, it's a, it's a Q&A box, I've been reminded. There's a, there is a Q&A box. So please put your questions down there and we, we have a bit of a voting uh, a, a session going on there. But without um, much further ado, I think, um, let me introduce to you um, now Marta Foresti, who is um, Director of ODI Europe and leads the ODI Human Mobility Initiative, um, as I said, and she is a visiting uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Global Affairs and the London School of Economics. She's also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Migration Policy and Practice, as well as the board of Pocauso.org. Org. Uh, Marta, I think I can give even a much longer introduction uh, to the important work that you do in the space of migration, but I think that for our session here and, and in relation to the launch of the Mixed Migration uh, Review 2020, we, we thought that you could lead us on this, on this topic where we want to look at cities as, as, as opportunities, you know, these are rival cities, how are they really enabling local integration and boosting economic development, and if you could really just zoom in and focus on the kind of win-win solutions and the kind of win-win uh, situations that we have seen, both offering this, you know, what you just talked about, this sort of balanced economic opportunity with access to refugees and, and how that also boosts through uh, local economic development. Um, and in your intervention as well, I think it would be great for us to hear a bit more about the pragmatic action, uh, I think, in which cities are sort of working together across borders um, uh, in terms of how do you make it, you know, how is it much more smart how are migration policies much more humane and how are they much more productive as well? So over to you, Marta. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paddy. So um, let me pick up where I left you earlier. Having made the case that when you look at um, the phenomenon of human mobility from an urban perspective, you're fundamentally approaching it from a different viewpoint and you are opening up a different conversation about the reality of the fact that people move to cities, are in cities. And as a reminder, yes, a lot of migrants and, and refugees and other migrants are in cities. The other very important background uh, piece of information to bear in mind is that, of course, the world is rapidly urbanizing. It is projected that by 2050, two thirds of all of us will live in cities. And so we are looking at cities not as a static uh, concept, but very much places that are you know, shrinking or growing, and many are growing, particularly in, in certain parts of the world, in Africa, for example, very rapidly. And so when you're looking at the realities of what we call migration, it, it is, a, is a phenomenon inside this, if, if you want this bigger phenomenon, the fact that cities are, are, are growing and are, you know, and they're growing as a result of people moving into cities seeking, seeking uh, opportunity. So cities offer an opportunity to look at this phenomenon from a different perspective, and fundamentally one that takes away the highly polarized and, and highly politicized debate on, uh, on otherness and on migration being a phenomenon about you know, somebody other than me coming into my space. This is about our shared space where the others move with us together and we become the reality of, um, of you know, the, re the everyday reality of the city. So it, very practically, um, all this has one important uh, consideration at its basis that, of course, cities and mayors and local administrators have no say in most cases in determining migration policies. They're very, you know, they have no say in influencing the political debate about how to regulate who has access and who doesn't on a particular border, uh, on you know the characteristics of visas policies or quota systems or, or any of that. On the other hand. Mayors and uh, local policymakers have one key responsibility, which is, of course, urban policies and making you know the you know their cities thrive, whether it is supporting their economies or providing services for all the citizens. So this very practically means that all the practical actions that can be taken here are not in necessarily in the traditional migration space. You know, this is not for mayors of the cities to um, 
necessarily to be at the forefront of organizing returns, for example, or of you know um, uh, providing um, you know um, um, regulations or you know or access uh, at particular people with particular qualifications. But on the other hand, they can integrate the fact that people move as a key determinant, a key component of urban policies. And so it, what this means in practice that you move towards the realities, of specific aspects of urban policies, be it uh, providing services, being the local green economy, being um, you know the, the challenges of uh, solid waste management, being you know uh, transport and inclusive um, uh, and, and mobility in cities, or things like co health coverage in ways that assures you know the health and the well-being of all the residents in a city. And it's this sort of um, this uh, observation that there are a lot of similarities in the way in different cities around the world address those issues, notwithstanding their realities in terms of their locations, of course, with great differences in terms of access to resources. But of course, these very practical realities that urban centers face are very common across the world. And this is at the heart of a conversation between two visionary mayors that of course are on the leadership board of the Mayor Migration Council. And we hear from Samir in a minute, the mayor of Milan, uh, Beppe Sala, and the mayor of Freetown, Ivona Kisoyer, who met in New York at the back or on the, around um, the leadership board of the Mayor of Migration Council and had a conversation about how much they had in common across one of the most controversial geographical divides when it comes to migration debate, which is the one between Africa and Europe. And so the observation that the cities of Milan and the city of Freetown could actually work together to address these very practical problems that urban administrators have when trying to accommodate the needs and recognize and fulfill the rights of all of their residents, they resolved to actually call for other fellow mayors in the two continents to see whether they thought there was a purpose in coming together to collaborate precisely on those very, on those very practical grounds. And that's how the Mayor's Dialogue on Growth and Solidarity began, which is today a platform of about 20 cities in Africa and Europe, um, with the mayors committed to, um, to collaborate uh, across the boundaries, across the borders, on all kinds of aspects of human mobility. So one of the key things that the cities have in common is that cities migrate and emigrate from the cities in different ways. So Mayor Aki Sawyer is dealing both with the phenomenon of immigration from outside Freetown. Recently, because of COVID, we have, as we heard earlier, this relatively new phenomenon of reverse migration of people wanting to leave the city, but at the same time having you know, youth wanting to leave Freetown because of lack of opportunities and potentially you know, uh, um, going on to dangerous journeys uh, through irregular channels of migrations. And similarly, a mayor like Mayor Salah has the challenge of a lot of young talent leaving the city of Milan for the rest of Europe, where there is free movement, and at the same time being most recently, certainly since 2015, much more involved in the integration of migrants arriving in Italy with very few opportunities to move on anywhere else in the European Union. Um, and so this is what the practical, this is the, so the first aspect of practicalities is collaboration. And if you think that's actually quite revolutionary, we have, you know, states around the world increasingly un, you know, unwilling to work together, including in the face of a global pandemic. And mayors very smartly and very pragmatically worked out that actually there is a lot to be said in sort of pooling resources and trying to come together and to try to, given the commonality of their challenges and the opportunities to, uh, to work together, in, in this way. And so um, the, um, the, 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 the specific areas where these mayors are, have started to collaborate very much, you know, starting with the objectives and the priorities of urban policies in which, you know, the migrant population is a component of include things like Milan and Freetown working together on the fashion industry, recognizing that there is a possibility of investment from Milan into Freetown into so nurturing the young talent um, that uh, that um, that is there and at the same time the opportunities for um, for um, the workforce youth you know the young workforce in Freetown to have opportunities to learn and to well in the, you know when we will be able to uh, to to move and to travel temporarily to Milan to get some um, to get some training and very much in a spirit of exchange of opportunities and exchange of skills and exchange of uh, of, 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 of lessons of what can be done in practice. Um, we have cities, Bristol, Durban and others who are interested in working together on housing. So the very practical challenge that with rapidly growing urban populations, shortages of housing and the quality of housing becomes a real problem, particularly financing 
um, housing in different ways, bringing together public and private, um, uh, public and private funding. Um, and, uh, and another key topic is, of course, integration into the labour market. I mean, this is where, you know, the, the main reasons why refugees and migrants are in cities is because they look for work, because that's in cities is where there are opportunities to work. And so um, successful, meaningful integration into the labour market, fulfilling, you know, different, you know, rights for every worker is at the forefront, is, is a major priority for a lot of cities across the European and African divide. So you start to have all these very pragmatic entry points for collaboration, but against a very specific political and policy background, which is one where there is a real sense of urgency for the two continents to find ways to collaborate again, once more, because also of the impact that COVID will have. Europe has been really badly hit by COVID in terms of the health crisis. Africa far less so, but the projection is that there will be you know, a very severe economic impact coming down the line that was already um, showing in, in, in some African countries. So again, the need for the two continents to find ways to collaborate as equal partners in ways that a lot of member states across the Mediterranean really struggle to find commonality on. And migration is a major uh, um, uh, roadblock, I would say, is a major gridlock in finding uh, pract you know, practical ways of collaboration across Africa and Europe. And so this is the other very practical things that these mayors are showing. They're showing that they actually can come together in an equal partnership, in a partnership of equal where cities and mayors see eye to eye, work together on common, very practical problems on the ultimate sort of political hot potatoes across um, international relations between Europe and Africa, which is migration. And very practically, they will feed ideas into the upcoming summit of the African Union and the European Union next spring, hopefully next spring, and the, hopefully the Portuguese presidency. And so these mayors, these 20 mayors, will have very concrete offers to show to that summit where I think we can all predict migration will not be an area of great convergence. Mm -hmm continent on what can be done in practice to accommodate the reality of human mobility uh, within the two continents and across the two continents. Marta, thank you for, for that intervention. And then maybe I would just quickly ask for half a minute, uh, maybe a minute to Samir and half a minute to Otilia. You know, um, I think Marta has really gone in getting more talent. What can you do? You can collaborate, you can engage, you can think outside your borders. Uh, and actually you can also think outside the limitations of your policy uh, settings. Uh, Samir, your comments on this for a minute. Um, yeah, I think, well, I think Marta really laid out the, the environment really, really well. Um, and I think, you know, the interesting thing that that at least we're seeing the Mayor's Migration Council is that, you know, some cities are not waiting on formal uh, forums for dialogue, but actually reaching out to uh, their national counterparts or other cities themselves. I'm thinking here of the city of Kampala which it has no mandate uh, to, to you know, specifically focus on its refugee population, which lies at the office of the prime minister. But when they established their forum, um, their city forum, uh, they made sure that the office of the prime minister was invited and included. They didn't need to do that. They, they extended a hand. And I think that you know, those are the small examples that you start to see and the willingness that cities are showing. Otilia? Um, in less than 30 seconds, what Marta and uh, Samir both said, I will say exactly that, but now I will put it in bold, italicize it and underline it. Collaboration across countries, uh, across cities goes without saying it's the way of now, but it's also importantly for the future. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for those interventions. And now we have uh, um, uh, some questions that have already been um, set. And I will ask Abe Odunlami, uh, as well as Victoria Herman, to just join us. You can unmute yourselves and ask the questions uh, for this topic. Yes. Hi. Um, how are you guys doing? Hi, Abe. Yeah, so um, my name is Abe Odolami and um, I am uh, an urban theorist and um, a lecturer at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Um, a lot of my work um, sort of straddles around this concept of opportunities for people migrating to urban spaces, um, but looks at it from the perspective of um, the different forms of emancipation that people are seeking. So it's either cultural, social, or economic. And the question that I have is, um, how do you guys um, think of 
um, the opportunities that would be available for our, um, um, migrants, but also how urban spaces are thinking of opportunities as technology starts to sort of erode or replace the concept of work in many different forms. So um, one of the biggest threat, um, trends you're seeing is automation, artificial intelligence, um, but also in the development of smart cities, um, the tr traditional opportunities that are there for people newly arriving in urban spaces are being replaced by machines and automation. And I'm thinking, um, I'm, I'm wondering how you guys are thinking of um, how these urban spaces, but also mayors are trying to address the erosion of opportunities in spaces like this. Thanks, Abe. I'll go straight over to you, Marta. Thank you. A, a, a really interesting question. Uh, I don't have obviously the you know the definitive answers. I will say a couple of things. The first is that specific before we get into the uh, the automation and digitalization. On your point about integration from both an economic, cultural, uh, and, and and social perspective, one of the things that is interesting working with these cities in in Africa and Europe that becomes very apparent is that in the city space those th those things go hand in hand, and so that particularly looking at uh, labor, particularly um, access and labor market policies that genuinely consider aspects of integration that are also social or actually culture being a major area where this mayors and cities sees opportunities to collaborate. So cultural events, culture related uh, activities uh, where, um, you know, where um, dif you know, different segments of the populations can make a, a contribution. On digitalization, I would say a couple of things. I mean, your your scenarios where people people are newly arrived in cities and 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 find jobs that are likely to be replaced by AI is definitely a reality. It's also a, a one way of thinking about the reality of urban migration, particularly around the different levels of skills, or maybe migrants moving to cities, hoping to gain you know additional skills, but in the process to um, uh, to work, for example, in different jobs that. Um, are, you know, probably require you know, you know, lower level of skills that will be replaced by, by uh, digitalization. And on the other hand, but the same, at, the same, at the same time, though, there is an issue to think about the new kind of skills that will be needed in a digital economy. We've done, for example, some work at ODI looking at the low carbon transition and the fact that, you know, that in what ways the migrant workforce will be able to not just, you know, will be impacted, but will also be able to contribute to economic transformation that would require a risk killing. And this idea that the skills that might be needed to implement you know, digital revolutions or AI-based economies may not be at hand in, you know, with the local residents. And so the idea that you could look at the skills that are needed to you know, for particular kinds of economic transformation that will actually, by the way, lead into increased employment opportunities and in ways that may not be so obviously found you know, in, in local populations and where um, the migrant workforce might, might play a role. This is, I think, to me, is a particularly interesting way of thinking about migration, not just as migration as we know it now, but the migration of the futures. So, you know, the mobility of the future generations that will be, you know, will be skilling up in the next few years and making sure that the ability to move and to experience, um, you know, the skills development in different places will be part of the skills development aspects. There are all sorts of experimentations going on with skills partnerships and finding way to create opportunities for countries to fund skills development in different ways. And I think that skills for the digital economy should be a component of that in ways that rather than assuming that there will be fewer jobs for the migrant workforce, also looks at the opportunities to amplify the job opportunities for the migrants of the future who will have the necessary skills in this new, um, in this new economic landscape. Summer. Do you want to just come in and tell us uh, a little bit more about what you think? What are we thinking about dig digitalization and uh, and the kind of uh, labor force? Well, I think I mean in a recent interview, and, and she's going to rightly get recognized quite a bit and already has. But uh, Mia Acker Sawyer in, in Freetown rightly points out that histories are historically, you know, they attract people from other parts because of economic reasons, and then the cities are those drivers of economic growth. And yes, we are in sort of a new way of working with, with digitization, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you're starting to see, you know, if some, some mayors are starting to think about how to proactively leverage the opportunities that migrants and refugees bring into cities to fill some of these, um, to fill some of these, these new industries within their cities. 
I'm thinking about uh, green infrastructure in Nairobi and Kampala. I'm thinking about the creation of PPE in Kampala. And no, this doesn't touch specifically on technology and the technology industry. But you know, why, why put a barrier around where, how, uh, and with whom, and through what that refugees and migrants can work? I think, you know, let's let's try out some of these. Let's let's see where these jobs exist and and how we can best match them up. And including, I think, Otilia mentioned engaging the private sector in trying to identify those opportunities. Thank you, Summer. Uh, Victoria Herman, can I just ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thanks, Paddy. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria Herman, and I am the Productive Migration Policy Lead um, at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, so I'm approaching this from the perspective um, of a donor um, who wants to know more about uh, what organisations like the FCDO can do to work with and support cities. Um, and just let me say, let me start by saying thank you to the MMC for this really thought provoking report and the panelists for what's already been um, a really illuminating discussion this afternoon, especially the example of cross border collaboration between cities that we've just heard about. Um, and my question is this. Um, we know that uh, the policy ecosystem that migration takes place within can make a huge difference to how successful labour migration is for migrants, as well as their families and uh, uh, origin and host communities. And by ecosystem, I mean the laws, the rules, the frameworks that govern migration um, that can make or break a migration experience in terms of migrants being able to realise the full socio-economic benefits of their movement. So with that in mind, I was wondering if the panelists could provide any examples of how those in power in cities have been able to influence policy making at the national uh, and or regional level um, so that migration management can be as conducive as possible to the realisation of those benefits. Um, or alternatively, examples of how those in cities um, have established or can establish their own governance systems. Um, in spite of national uh, rhetoric and approaches. Um, it would be great to hear any examples of both. Thank you, over. Thank you, Victoria. Otilia, can I put you on the spot for this one? Um, I, I was hoping that you would, you would start with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with Samir um, on that. But I think um, if, if you don't mind, Paddy, sort of just paraphrasing Victoria's question for me, so it's a bit clearer. Hi, Otilia. I think here she's looking out for regional examples in, in sort of uh, the influence that comes from bottom up. Um, if you could just dwell, dwell in a little bit from your perspective, uh, we can give you half a minute to think about it uh, while we, we bring uh, Samir, uh, Samar on the spot for this one. Uh, yeah, thank you, Victoria, for your question. <laughs> I kind of want to answer the funding question, but I'll, I'll answer this one. Um, <laughs> I think um, let, me, let me point out one national example and one city example. The national example that I point out is in Uruguay, um, where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has established a national migration board, which, among other things, trains and builds the capacity of mission, municipal officials, collects data and case studies from local administration, and coordinates policy efforts with local departments. And this has helped address key bottlenecks in critical service delivery uh, including the provision of temporary housing. So that's, that's an example of good collaboration and what you can actually achieve when you have harmony between national policies and city action. Um, I think, uh, Victoria, you used the word on the local, on the city example, you used the term, you know, what cities are doing despite of national policies. And I think, um, you know, I, I think cities, I think it's important to note that cities are going to take these positive actions uh, maybe not despite, but regardless of national policies, if they're, uh, if they're positive and they're in line, great, fantastic, let's see what we can do. If they're not, then you have cities like Los Angeles. I mean, we all know that the national ecosystem of the US has changed uh, recently, um, but you have cities like Los Angeles that are taking an active um, leadership role in providing um, I think free of charge legal services to their undocumented migrants within their city, B 
being vocal against national policies uh, for the situation and experience that immigrants had been had been dealing with on the border, um, and really, really showing leadership on that issue, um, not only in, in diplomacy and in dialogue, but actually on the ground as well. Super. Otile. Uh, right. So looking, and, and, and I'm almost coming back here uh, where I am um, uh, in, in South Africa. And, and for me, when I think uh, and conceptualize bottom up, um, I'm, I'm taking it below, if I can put it that way, and, 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 and don't, please don't see this as a hierarchy, a vertical hierarchy, but rather um, I, I go back to, to the community level um, and the efforts that are being made that then help to inform and shape in, in many ways uh, city policy and then provincial and, 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 and at a country level. So one of the things, uh, it was ironic almost uh, within the South African context was the emphasis on uh, essentially foreigners or people from outside of South Africa being held as responsible for taking jobs. Um, and part of the research that was conducted a few years ago by the Migrating for Work Research Consortium looked actually at the extent to which migrants were actually creators of employment and how that could be used to shape uh, city level, but also provincial and national policy around uh, essentially better employment practice. But also, um, and, and, and Samar uh, uh, alluded to this also, which is this issue of necessity almost being the mother of invention or innovation. So where you do not have direct um, uh, uh, access or means, your ability to almost adapt and shape uh, uh, within that context. And for that, I'll, I'll restress this point, which is we have to actually do essentially what the people that uh, compiled the mixed migration review did, which is to speak to the communities on the ground to better understand how to shape policy. Policy uh, being uh, uh, sort of uh, umbrellaed or parachuted over what is happening on the ground can sometimes actually serve uh, as a frustrator. And Paddy, if I may, just in very quick response to the question that was posed earlier by, by Abby, and he posed it around, you know, these um, essentially as uh, tech uh, frustrating processes rather than it being a, 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 an opportunity. And I was thinking, I do not know where everyone is at the moment. What I do know for sure is that they're not in my house. And I know that the one thing that humans are particularly adept at doing, if this year has taught us anything, is to adapt, adapt, adapt. And in adaptation to innovate. Where are the spaces where new jobs can be created? Where are the spaces that work for people already in the country for which we may need new skills? It's ultimately, um, as society evolves, uh, believe it or not, so do we. And I think we ought to leverage the benefits where we can and to mitigate the risks also where we can. Well, Atelia, I'm happy that we are with you in your living room through this uh, means of technology. And on that, we will move on to our topic number three, because we are in the interest of time. We would like to make sure that our audience is able to catch our excellent panelists and, and ask them some of the questions that have been raised. And let me just open up then the last topic that we have that looks at national versus local migration um, uh, policies. And I think, Samir, you already started touching on this in terms of looking at this as a practical uh, rebellion. That's the question that we asked out to you. Uh, but a, a quick intro of who uh, Summer is. Summer, Summer Saliba is the, is the head of practice for the Mayor's Migration Council. Uh, he, he did indicate that he's only been there for a couple of weeks, but he's not um, very new to the area of working with migrants, refugees, and also IDPs, because he has been working for over 10 years uh, in, this, um, in this field, and particularly looking at making cities more inclusive of displaced and marginalized uh, people. Uh, and he has worked as an advisor at the International Rescue Committee. And he has also worked directly in places like Amman, Athens, Milan, Kampala, to mention uh, uh, just a few. And in this work, he's produced a lot of different uh, countless reports um, that, uh, that um, 
are available that really look at how to deliver programs in cities and mostly those that impact on migration and displacement as well as looking at conflict. So I think he is rightly placed uh, and also I think this topic really comes and envelopes everything that we have looked at from, you know, from the protection angle from cities as op opportunities. And now, uh, Samir, we, uh, Summer, we're asking you the, the very difficult but maybe simple questions here where we are, uh, you know, we want to sort of know you know, for, for, for either ethical, practical, or political reasons, what can we learn from some of the city's positive and progressive approaches to mixed migration? And here we want you to also bring in this aspect of the COVID pandemic and tell us a bit more about how, you know, how, how does that sit um, in level of importance uh, uh, in terms of urban migration response. Um, and then you are, you know, you're also welcome to, you know, give us a little bit uh, of insights to uh, uh, giving more space for voices of, of, of migrants and refugee policies that look at the national, the regional and the global level. So over to you, Summer. Yeah, thanks, Patty. And apologies for launching into this uh, at the start of my intervention. I think um, I've been touching on this in, in my remarks throughout, so I'll just keep it brief. I think, you know, if I were to sum it up, I would just say that cities really don't have the luxury to waste time rebelling against what they think is wrong because they have to spend their time, their resources, and their energy acting on what they know is right. And I think, you know, I actually think that Bram in his introduction to the Mixed Migration Review 2020, uh, you can get it at your nearest bookseller <laughs> today. Um, he put it really nicely when he said, quote, urban policies cannot ignore migration and migration policies cannot ignore urbanization, end quote. And I think what's implied here is that urban policies rest with city governments while migration policies rest with national governments. And so imagine what we could collectively achieve if we had alignment between national policies, city government action, and then wedged in between international financing, international tech technical support to really make sure that that, that action is happening. Uh, and that's the conversation that I wanna be a part of. That's the conversation that my organization, the Mayor's Migration Council is creating the space for. Um, and I really think there's so much potential if we sort of move on from cities versus states and consider moving towards cities with states and what can we collectively achieve within that framework i'll just stop there sam i wasn't even expecting you to be that brief but uh, i think punctual to the point you know acting on what you know is right and i think that has a lot to say about the level of intent uh, which is there uh, and 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 that's saying you know pushing through against the odds um, and here then, I would just like then to ask Marta, if you could start with um, a bit of, of your reflections. I think also touching a bit on looking, you know, how migrants moved into the space of being these, you know, um, first of all, disposable, uh, a disposable, uh, you know, part of our society to being essential, uh, particularly in the space of the COVID and how you sort of see um, uh, the space that uh, they have or they do not have uh, between national uh, uh, um, and local policies. Marta. Okay, thank you. First of all, just to pick up what Samir said, I think is, is I mean, I, it really, um, it occurred to me recently that there is such, we have such a, a, um, a habit of describing the tension between national policies and local policies, which exists. I mean, if you hear um, Mayor Akisoya is one, but almost any mayor Particularly those who are not aligned politically with, you know, with the with with the national government, talk about the the challenges of being, you know, a, a, a politician and actually a policymaker at the local level uh, in ways that can, you know, is limited by definition by national policies. That's not unreal. On the other hand, when it comes to migration um, and urban policies, the interesting, you know, dynamic here is that, of course. The, the, the management of migration at the national level and the national, you know, the sovereignty the nation states have in deciding migration policies has come, you know, has not been, it's not the best, in, in, it has not facilitated international cooperation. If anything, it has, has become probably one of the policy areas where nation states have really struggled to meaningfully cooperate. And so this is where actually therefore mayors have a little bit of, a, of, of space precisely because they're not in charge of determining migration policies, but have, are in charge of urban policies and therefore can actually integrate the fact that people move into their planning, into their resource allocation, into their uh, principles, which are really important, into their sort of motivations and visions about what they're trying to achieve 
um, at the city level. We should never forget that cities are, by definition, places of diversity. Cities are places where people over the centuries have learned to live with one another and to learn from one another. And so I think that's a real opportunity to actually create that space, almost like the interface between national policies that are actually really, really difficult politically to get going right now. It's very difficult to do anything constructive on migration for almost any leader um, in, in the world, certainly in Europe. Uh, whereas at the city level, this is where pragmatically mayors can find little, you know, little way in into the reality of, of mobility at the urban level. And then on the second uh, point, actually, can I try something a bit technologically advanced? I'll just uh, share my screen and show you an image. I just want to show you this. So this is some of you would have seen um, some of the work that ODI has done over the last few months tracking the migrant contribution to the uh, COVID response in a data visualization that you can explore in your own time. But the only reason why I'm showing you this is because these trees are growing by the day. So every other week we add to this, um, to this tree a little red dot, which is yet another story of how, you know, of, of an example of how things have happened that has facilitated or how, where the contribution of migrants have made to the COVID experience. One of the latest one we had last week was a certain um, company um, um, discovering a vaccine in Germany. Um, uh, and that, that was a company um, held, you know, uh, run by two, the, the kids of two Turkish uh, migrants okay. to Germany. And one of the reasons I'm showing you this is simply because, and this is your answer, um, Paddy, is because um, a, 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 a vast, you know, a, a large number of those stories are stories from the stem from the local level, where the action was taken at the local level. It could be a mayor, it could be, think of, a, think of the role of the state governor, the, the governance in the United States. So whereas migration policy may well be the remit of, of nation states, the implementation rests with local policymakers. So that particular regulation that you need to allow the nurses in training from third countries to be able to work extra hours or uh, what you need to implement to make sure that you know agricultural workers can you know to implement say the regularization incentives or the integration policies mm -hmm. those are implemented at the local level and so so many of the actions have happened at the local level and that's where again rather than seeing the contrast once you see the opportunity to acting locally often in you know because one because whether you're a mayor or you know a local say say a local business woman you know the space you have to act in contrast to what are at times you know highly politicized uh, okay. positions that are taken nationally is is, is 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 likely to be more significant and so um, again it's not a matter of being naively optimistic okay. but to recognize the space that has been created at the local level for action Marta, thank you for that intervention. I will ask Lamine Abda to just come in and give us your question. Just introduce yourself briefly and try and make your question brief. And uh, I will ask um, uh, Summer and uh, Ortelia to give their one minute responses to, these, to this question from Lamine. Lamine, over to you. Thank you very much, Fadi. Uh, Good afternoon, and thank you to all panelists. A very interesting discussion. Uh, also, very great uh, publication. I think that will bring some more evidences to to the causes we defend. Um, I, I would like to to ask the panelists. Uh, I, I'm, I work for the Mediterranean City to City Migration uh, Project, which I'm the project manager. Uh, it's led by the International Center for Policy Migration Development (ICMPD) together with UCLG and UN Habitat. Uh, we are working on on this topic of urban uh, migration uh, since 2015 uh, when we started. I have to say that that was the start of an international movement on the topic. It was the first edition of the Mayoral Forum for uh, Human uh, Mobility and Development, uh, the first publication of IOM dedicated the, on, on the topic cities and migration, uh, the, the, the launch of the 2030 agenda. So I, I think it really launched the dynamic at the international level. And today we can see that uh, cities are have a stake and are recognized at the international level uh, as important stakeholders in the migration governance. Um, the panelists also said it, uh, cities uh, provide services to all independently of their, their legal status, uh, they, they ensure inclusion, social cohesion, uh, they, they make a lot of efforts to leave no one behind. Uh, but many of the actuations that cities are doing when it comes to migration uh, are borderline with the, the national policies and actually local, local leaders many times take risks 
when it comes to to actuating with uh, with migrants. Uh, and, and my question would be, how do we put now national governments in front of their responsibilities, and how we bring them to take on migration based on evidence and good knowledge of the situation on the ground? And and we know that the the good knowledge of the ground can only be done with in a straight partnership with cities. So. I, I again don't think that we need to look at uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, difficulties between national and local authorities as a, as a struggle. It should be a cooperation. We should have policy coherence. But I think cities are doing their part. National authorities and national governments do not take enough into account uh, what cities are doing. So how do we bring these national governments to listen more to cities? Thank you. A good angle to that question, Lamine. Um, and just to say that uh, we know we are running out of time, but we actually have decided to extend the webinar a little bit longer and our panelists have kindly accepted to stay in with us. So if you have posed some questions in the Q&A uh, tab and also for, for those who have comments, we will try our best to, to see what we can respond to. So hang on tight, we're still here with you. Uh, and I just ask uh, Summer if you could respond to that in a minute and then Otile if you could add on your reflection. Um, yeah, thanks Patty and thank you for the question. I mean, I, my partner hates when I say this because she does, says it doesn't make any sense. But I, I, what I like to say is that reality has yet to fall victim to the same fate as facts by which I mean facts can be twisted, they can be portrayed, you can pick and choose what they are. And that's unfortunately what we're seeing a lot of national governments do is pick and choose their facts. Cities don't have that luxury. They have the reality that some cities are doubling in size over the course of five years as you have in Amedaguri or in uh, Mafraq, Jordan, and they need to react to that reality. And the consequences of that reaction, the consequences of their willingness to act is what we should be basing our policies on. The benefits that migrants bring that they realize through that action, the inclusivity and the benefits of that inclusivity for all, all of the society that, that they realize through that action, that's really what we should be focusing on. Um, and not just for cities like uh, Freetown or Milan, but also cities like Mogadishu or Agadez or Meduguri, as I mentioned, those cities that are really dealing with a tough reality um, and doing so admirably, but would be, be so much better off if they had more resources and better national frameworks to support them on the ground. Thanks, Summer. Otilia? Uh, thank you for that. I think I'll just share uh, one example uh, coming from South Africa again of uh, almost accepting and understanding that this is something that has to be dealt with at multiple levels of governance. So I'm being very careful about referring to it as multiple levels of governance and not government, because I think those are those differ. So the South African government, through what is an interministerial committee process on population policy, has actually identified the issue of migration and urbanization now as a key priority. So in, 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 within that basket of who forms the interministerial committee, it is essentially a range of ministries, some of whom may be unusual suspects because they don't necessarily deal with migration, they deal with human settlements, they deal with education, they deal with home affairs, and they deal with statistics. So a range of actors, but also included in there are the various other international actors that can be able to assist and advise, including IOM, UNHCR, and then non-governmental organizations like my own as being part of a consultative status and, and giving advice where possible on better approaches. But included in that is the provincial as well as the local level government. And they recognize this disconnect between what's happening at local level versus the policies being implemented at national level. At the end of the day, and I'll restress this point, there is no point having even a good policy if in practice it's not being implemented. Likewise, having a bad policy that simply doesn't gel well. And I think these kinds of coordination mechanisms that require leadership are, are the way to go. And this means uh, different countries, different systems can be able to, to, to adopt and adapt in different ways because I do recognize that not all countries have a federal type of system that other countries do. And in some contexts, the uh, cities don't really have the freedom, so to speak, 
to even employ different policies or practices from the national government. Brilliant. Um, we have um, quite a number of questions in our Q&A. And I think we could probably go on for a very long time. Uh, I think this is usually what happens when the audience realizes that you have a good panel with you. Uh, but then I would just pick uh, two questions to start with, and we try to see if we can ask our panelists to be brief. Um, and I think this one I will ask you to, to, to sector into uh, the particular topic that you were covering for us. Uh, so the question, the question uh, that comes from Gregor Shuina, uh, I, I hope I have pronounced your name correctly, you know, talking about what the report focuses on, spaces of opportunity, uh, and the, that the preferred destination for child migrants and youth, international and internal, would the panelists be able to comment on the young migrants city? So I think that you're speaking from it from the different points of view that we have uh, asked you to be lead on the conversation. So Otilia, look at this angle of child migrants, uh, essentially, or young migrants, if we could, if we could couple them as, as such. And what does protection look like? Uh, Samara, what, does, you know, what do policies look like in terms of um, uh, for this particular group of migrants? And also for Marta, uh, in, in relation to, to opportunities, how do you want to answer this one? Do we do that in turn, Paddy? Yes, you can start with protection. Uh, great, thank you. Um, again, stating the obvious, the median age in Africa is just below 20, which means, like it or not, the uh, majority of people that will be on the move will be younger people seeking opportunities will be younger. So it almost again goes without saying, but policies have to be shaped to recognize the age of the majority of those people that are, that are moving. But likewise, um, in countries where they do settle, there has to be ways in order to, to actually adapt to that reality. Um, and so I, can't, I, I, I simply can't stress this enough but um, you cities will be younger. Cities, at least in Africa, are already young. And so there has to be policies and practices in place that recognize this reality. Marta? So um, youth, um, youth and cities go hand in hand. Um, um, again, you know, young people tend to be in cities or, uh, or move to cities. Um, I think when it comes to young migrants, this is one, and the same applies to women, by the way, this is where I think we all collectively need to make sure that we do do exercise that balance between the protection agenda and the opportunity agenda, because we're looking at in, you know, both people that are potentially vulnerable to particularly dangerous migration at the same time have you know, a lot to offer. Um, and a future ahead of them. And this is my final point, therefore, is that the way to think about youth and migration in terms of opportunities is not to be tricked into assuming that migration is the phenomenon of now. Uh, you know, the, the, all the data on migration tends to focus on the, you know, who are the migrants now. Um, let's think about who are the migrants of tomorrow and who are the people that will move up tomorrow. It's one of the most extraordinary things that happen in this country, in the UK, where I'm not originally from. If you think of the debate on the ending free movement as part of Brexit, it's almost completely blind to the reality that are also, you know, there, is, there are young generations who will not, you know, enjoy the right of free movement as a result of this policy change. And so think about policies for future young migrants. And this is where I would say digitalization and the grid economy uh, will produce a lot of opportunities for jobs and for skills and for economic transformation where young migrants will, will play, young urban migrants will play a key role. And therefore, it, it should be, you know, it is, is it should be a clear priority for policymakers, um, mayors certainly, uh, to have, you know, you, you know, age sensitive and so youth centered policies. Youth comes up in the in the dialogue between the African and European mayors comes up all the time. And I'm very glad to um, to say to Samir in particular that Agadez is part of the dialogue because I think he's absolutely right that. There is a real risk that these, pla these international platforms will focus only on the cities that have the resources, the political uh, freedom and the space to engage in, the, in these international debates, whereas we really need to think about the, the cities that are at the hard end of some of these debates. Mm. Samar. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think if I may, just I'll tie it to this question, but I, I wanted to just share the three sort of key messages that our mayors, because I think it's important to hear directly from mayors, um, offer in this time and the action points uh, around specifically COVID-19, but I'll, I'll tie it back to youth. 
The first is to ensure that services, regardless of migration status, including healthcare and, and, and economic relief, are accessible by all. The second, and I think this is especially important for youth, is to combat misinformation, racism, and xenophobia with positive narratives and uh, programs towards social cohesion. And thank you for, to the Mixed Migration Center for uh, changing the narrative with this fantastic report. And that, that those changes in the narrative, those specific words are called out numerous places um, within the report. And third, and most importantly, especially for youth, is to amplify, I'm not gonna say empower, but amplify the existing power of migrants and refugees to be a part of the solution, including through the regularization of immigrant essential workers. And Marta, you so beautifully touched on this. And I just wanna end by sort of saying, I, I, there's one young uh, migrant in Milan who's been messaging me <laughs> Uh, while we were on this webinar um, from Guinea, spent time in Mali, spent time in Libya, um, has been in Italy for several years. He landed when he, I think he was 19 and he's now 22, speaks fluent Italian, I believe has an Italian girlfriend. He won't tell me the details about that. Um, and is in, and has, a, has had a job for over two years for his entire time there. And yet still uh, is worried about his, his documentation status. Um, and I think it's really important just to close, I think, my remarks on, on highlighting that, th that these are, you know, youth are at the center of this conversation, um, but they're also the solution to this conversation, if we give them the opportunity to do so. Um, yeah, and I think uh, just really highlighting stories like that is, is crucially important. Summer, thank you for that. Um, I think we have actually run out of time uh, in order for us to, um, to, to, to take on all the many questions. We, we just want to say thank you to all the participants that are still with us. We still have a house um, full at 120 plus people uh, following the conversations that are going on here as we have launched the Mixed Migration uh, Review Report for 2020, which, um, which was really looking at urban migration. Um, and I wanted to also just point out that uh, some of the questions that have been posed that are related to the report itself, we would just uh, ask you to direct them back to uh, the Mixed Migration Center, who will be more than happy to give you some responses uh, uh, on those questions. I wanted to thank our, our able panelists uh, who have taken us into really a real dive, as well as those who had presented some questions um, uh, uh, to the individual sessions that we had. Um, I wanted to also thank uh, the technical team that is behind. Um, and sometimes I think you may have seen my hands crossing over the screen. It's because there's a, there's a huge team that's behind um, setting, this, uh, setting this whole up and making sure that we are all safe and comfortable in this Zoom room um, as, we, as, as we have deliberated on a number of issues. I uh, want to just take the opportunity um, to see if I could ask Bram to just come on and um, wrap us up for the day. But thank you, Summer. Uh, thank you, Otelia. And uh, thank you, Marta, um, for joining us and um, just um, sharing yeah, your insights into these very important topics that um, um, help us sort of, you know, uplift uh, the different elements that have been uh, launched in this report. Bram? Thank you very much, uh, Patty, and, and thanks for all the participants still uh, with us here today. I'm really not going to summarize uh, the discussions, of course, but I think we had some really, really rich discussions, uh, even after just developing a 270-page report on mixed migration in cities. I'm still learning a lot of new things here on this, uh, on this discussion, thanks to the great panelists. Um, <clears throat> I think one really key takeaway is this cross-border collaboration between cities. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, to make this world a slightly better place for, for refugees and migrants uh, on the move uh, and settling in, in cities. So I think this is really a key thing we can collectively uh, work on uh, with all of us here and uh, um, with city leaders uh, as well. So I would like to uh, end it there, uh, but a really big thanks to the speakers and, and the panelists for your great, great contributions uh, and to all the participants for joining us here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Paddy. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Paddy. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.